Hi, my name is Matt Greenfield, and I was the senior ADR director and English language producer for Neon Genesis Evangelion. It's been quite a while since I've watched these episodes, so it's kind of interesting for me coming back and looking at it after all these years. Uh, of course, the episodes you're looking at now have been completely remixed in 5.1 stereo, and the images have been completely reprocessed off the original film, so this looks so much better than the show did when we originally released it. When we uh, released the show originally, what we had was the versions that were run on Japanese television. Uh, basically, there were a lot of film splices that were actually in the original master, and when the splices went through the telecine machine, you'd get a little jump. Uh, the state of video encoding back then was nowhere near where it is now, so the colors would bleed. And, of course, it was simply a stereo mix. So this is really an interesting uh, experience going back and taking ADR work that we did so far back and repurposing it for this version. Uh, Wade Shimwell, who is the uh, mixer for the 5.1 version, has done a phenomenal job. I watched the, uh, the finished results just the other day and was stunned at how really nice this show sounded uh, for something that was recorded under the conditions it was originally recorded on. You have to understand that when we did this show originally, ADV had only done a half dozen or so English language dubs. Uh, and this was only the second TV series we had started. We had just, uh, a few months before this, started production on Blue Seed, which was our first commitment to a long show. Up until that point, we'd only done OVAs. Uh, and even the longest of those was like a, a four episode, five episode series. We had done uh, Mighty Space Miners. We had done uh, Samurai Showdown. Uh, we had done... Uh, the first Devil Hunter Yoko, the first Burn Up, uh, and the first two Gunsmith Cats, uh, among others. And it was really an interesting experience going back in with the idea that we had this long format show with this storyline that was going to continue uh, throughout that many episodes and try and make it all continuous because the trick about Ava uh, for those who are watching it for the first time is there's a lot of double meaning in a lot of the lines you have to watch the whole show all the way through and then come back uh, again and watch it again and you'll see things and hear things that you didn't hear the first time because once you know where it's going you'll suddenly realize that oh okay what they said and what you originally interpreted it as meaning isn't what you thought it meant. Um, this is especially true of the character of Ritsuko. Uh, she has a couple of lines that can only be attributed as just plain evil uh, when you actually understand uh, what she's actually referring to. So when we started working on this show, we wanted to bring in a bunch of new vocal talents specifically to differentiate it from Blue Seed. We had pretty much used up the leads from the previous couple of shows on Blue Seed, and we ended up using a couple of them over again. Uh, Kurt Stoll uh, ended up playing Kinsuke uh, and did a wonderful job. And it was just it was a natural for it. And uh, then we had uh, also brought uh, Amanda Wynn back. Uh, she was playing the lead in Blue Seed and she was really wanting to play the part of Misato uh, and I was like Amanda I just I think another spunky character uh, it's gonna be too close to what you're doing in some of the other shows because she was also Rally Vincent and she was Yoko and I really thought that Allison Keith who had just started with us was the ideal choice uh, Allison was someone who uh, Amanda had met uh, through an improv group, if I recall correctly, and had brought in uh, to audition, uh, and actually, I believe, made her first vocal appearance in Super Atragon. Uh, but uh, she was, at the time, she had just been cast in Blue Sea to Sakura, and she just really had a natural flair for it, and she could also do a lot of things that were natural for Misato, like belch on cue, which turned out to be very useful. Uh, but anyway, uh, Amanda was really dead set on me, so I said, honestly, Amanda, uh, I've seen the show a couple of times, you want to play Ray. It's, it's going to be a nice stretch for you, and uh, 
she has never, ever regretted ending up taking the part of Ray because, of course, Ray is such an iconic figure and is so immediately identified with Ava in people's minds. Uh, the other major female character, Asuka, uh, people kept saying, who's going to play Asuka? It's going to be Tiffany Grant, isn't it? Because everybody who knew Tiffany and who knew the Asuka character said, oh, there's just so much about Tiffany that just reminds us uh, all of Asuka. I'm not saying... Uh, she is Oscar, but there's a lot of Oscar in her. Plus, the fact was that Tiffany could actually speak German, uh, and actually ended up writing uh, the German dialogue for the show, because most of the German that Oscar speaks turned out to be uh, pretty pigeon. Uh, in some cases, uh, we're not even sure what they were trying to say, so we had to kind of reconstruct it from scratch. Uh, a lot of new people did start on the show, though. Uh, Gil Lundy. Uh, who plays Fiutsky. Uh This was pretty much his first major role for us. Uh, Tristan McAvery had done a few small parts, but this was his first major role. And Spike Spencer uh, was brand new to us. He had done a few quick parts, and Spike will actually be on the commentary track later. Uh, we'll talk more about that then. But this was really uh, only his second lead character. In casting Shinji, was really, really difficult because the Japanese performer was actually a woman. And we tried a number of women uh, reading the part of Shinji. We tried some actual kids and found that the kids that we were able to find at that time simply didn't have the dramatic range. And the women all sounded too young. You can buy the Japanese Shinji, I think partially because he's speaking in Japanese, which is a little harsher language, uh, and also uh, because they, they were really lucky and they got a phenomenal performer who could play that low. Uh, these days, I don't think I'd have too much trouble finding a woman who could play Shinji, but at the time, uh, we really felt that we needed someone who was very identifiably male, and Spike plays a 13-year-old fairly convincingly, I think, uh, even today. Uh, we went back and recorded the uh, director's cuts, and I thought his work on those was superlative. And at the time, um, he was exactly right. He was His voice has dropped a little since then, but his voice at the time was very high and said, yeah, okay, we buy that. that that's a kid who's just gone through voice change, but it hasn't completely dropped yet. Yeah, uh, and he's a phenomenal actor. Uh, he's a little on the hyper side, uh, but uh, we would be recording, and he would be bouncing around the booth, literally. Uh, he was, uh, actually still is, very heavily into martial arts, and when he wasn't actually recording, would be in the booth stretching, uh, doing push-ups and calisthenics, so it was kind of a, a weird situation where you've got this character who is so physically repressed being played by this actor who is bouncing off the foam in the booth. Uh, we also had a lot of problems, and we'll talk about this when when we get Spike on here later, uh, with recording him naturally, because Shinji's range is so extreme. He goes from talking very soft to screaming at the top of his lungs uh, with basically no break between them. And in the days when we were doing this, the equipment we had was really sensitive to that kind of dynamic range. Uh, the, the kind of compression software and so on that's available today just wasn't there. So we would often have this wonderful take that would start off great and then have to cut in in the middle of it with another take uh, that was compressed differently in order to get the, the whole actor's line in without distorting because we were always saying, well, that was a great take, but it's distorted. Let's do it again. That's something we don't have to deal with at all anymore. And I don't... Uh, well, I have, I have great regrets about having left Wade here to clean this up because when we originally did it, there was some stuff we left in. We're saying, well, it's a little on the distorted side, but it's the best read emotionally. And he's really been able to clean up a lot of that. Uh, some of the other actors who came in on the show really for the first time, uh, Sue Ulu as Ritsuko. Uh, if I recall correctly, this was the first thing she ever did for us, and we tossed her into a lead, and uh, she came out of it quite well. Uh, we also had uh, Aaron Crone, who had done a small part, actually two small parts in Samurai Showdown, and then played the, the villainous Haints in uh, Gunsmith Cats, and he was the villainous McCoy in the original Burn Up. But he hadn't done a whole lot for us, and we cast him as Kaji. Uh, 
and just a wonderful, wonderful blend of uh, acting and image. Uh, Aaron is one of those actors who's always amazed me in that he was able to capture the nuances on the screen on the fly. He would see the character start making uh, an expression and it would show up in his voice almost instantaneously while he was doing a dry read and when you actually went back and did the uh, the take he was just dead on just a, a wonderful well he was actually he was doing Murakumo as well in Blue Seed at this time but Murakumo hadn't appeared so technically he started Kashi about the same time he started Murakumo uh, then uh, Gosh, there were so many actors on this show. It, it seemed like we were... To, oh, Joe Paisano was the original Toji. Uh, Toji was an interesting character problem for us because we actually had three Tojis over the course of the show. Joe was the original, and uh, believe it or not, he ran off to join the circus. I, I've never heard anyone use that excuse before, but he did. He ran off to join the circus in the middle of the production, and we got him back once and did another set of episodes, and then we simply weren't able to contact him, and we brought in... A second Toji, who uh, did one volume and did extremely well, and I'm not going to tell you which volume he took over in, um, but then he got an option to go to, uh, excuse me, opportunity to go to England to study with the Royal Shakespeare Company, so he was gone. So Brett Weaver took over as the third Toji. Amazingly, that was the only... Uh, voice changeover we had uh, until we did the director's cuts, where obviously people had been gone for a number of years and we had to replace them. Another person who made a basically a de debut on the show was Kendra Benham uh, playing Ibuki. Uh, Kendra and Spike were an item. Uh, they are since man and wife, which brings up one of the other Ava side stories, which is uh, interesting, which is that uh, the three original kids, uh, played by Spike Spencer, Tiffany Grant, and Amanda Wynn, uh, all ended up marrying the three original bridge crew, played by uh, Kendra, Jason Lee, and Brian Gronvelt, which uh, is actually myself working under a pseudonym. Uh, just very strange that that happened. Uh, even odder is the fact that uh, the uh, Japanese director was actually dating Asuka at the time, and, uh, well, here I am, now married to Asuka. Go figure that one out. Now, if you're wondering why I, I do record uh, these parts under a pseudonym, it's because when we first started, uh, it just seemed really strange to me to be putting my name on a show that I was already writing, directing, and producing. Uh, so I said, okay, i got to cut something off. So I stuck everything as a single credit, written, produced, and directed by, so my name wasn't on the screen 14 times. Uh, and then the only reason I was actually acting in these shows was that when we first started doing our shows, we weren't using a studio that we owned. It was an outside studio that we rented, and actors had a bad habit of not showing.